Hello, everyone, and good evening. My name is Taryn Urquhart, and I am the Arts and Special Events Programmer here at the West Vancouver Memorial Library. On behalf of the Library and the West Vancouver Art Museum, I would like to welcome you to tonight's Art Talk. While I recognize that we are all in different places this evening, I would like to acknowledge that the West Vancouver Library and Art Museum reside within the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Squamish Nation, Tsleil-Waututh Nation, and Musqueam Nation. We recognize and respect them as nations in this territory, as well as their connection to the lands and waters around us since time immemorial. It has been my great pleasure to work with Alison Powell and her guests tonight to br bring this event to your screens. And now I would like to pass things over to Alison, who is waiting for us over at the museum. Alison? Thank you, Taryn, and thank you all for joining us this evening. My name is Alison Powell, and I'm the assistant curator here at the West Vancouver Art Museum. Uh, I'm also a settler living and working in the lands of the uh, Squamish Nation, the Tsleil-Waututh Nation, and the Musqueam Nation. And I'm joined by our featured artist uh, today, Aaron Nelson Moody. Uh, I'm uh, in English, Aaron Nelson Moody, uh, and in Squamish, and I come from uh, a village called Chiaknes, uh, though I live here in Homolchison in, uh, in North Shore. Well, thank you for joining me. Uh, and it's such a great opportunity to be able to speak about our um, experience putting this exhibition together. It's been about a year uh, that we've been working on it, and uh, now we're sitting in the exhibition space. And uh, when we first met each other, we sat down and had this long conversation. Um, I asked you about what drew you to making art and what drew you to carving. And it kind of opened up this larger conversation about how in your youth you were studying to become a journalist and how that path wasn't quite um, bringing you happiness. And uh, you ended up going on a seagoing trip with <coughs> Will Acton. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that kind of spurred um, this path for you. Do you want to speak a little bit about that? Sure, yeah. I think... Uh well, as now, I was also um, quite shy early in life, and um, just you know, I had thoughts or you know, creative ideas I wanted to express, and um, writing and photography seemed like a very safe way of doing it. I could hold the camera between me and the world, or the notepad between me and the world. Um, and at some point, I realized I wanted to interact more with people. Um, around the, the you know the time I was working, doing a lot of freelance work. Uh, my grandfather passed away, and uh, when I went home, um, I was challenged by uh, an, an elder to carry on some of my grandfather's teachings. And I wasn't really sure how to do that, but um, around, you know, at the same time, um, Sopluck was recarving one of our um, ancient designs of a seagoing canoe. And I was very excited to do that, so I, I worked really hard to get into the canoe, and we trained for months, and then paddled to Bella Bella. And on that trip, I got to see living culture in so many communities, uh, parts of culture that we'd lost in our, our home. And uh, I got to know Hull Acton better. Uh, I knew him a little bit as a boy, but um, he'd really flourished as an artist. And, you know, his confidence, his determination, his hard work, uh, his dedication to not only the, you know, the craft of carving, but also um, responsibility you know, he took for communities he worked in. And he was such a generous, sort of goofy, loving, cheerful guy. Um, you know, I just wanted to be like him. And uh, I was uh, very grateful that he took me under his wing and, um, you know, showed me a very new way of life, uh, which includes wood carving, stonework, uh, jewelry, and ceremony, drumming and singing, uh, all, the, all of the beautiful stuff that he does. And uh, when we were putting this exhibition together, um, it became very clear to me early on that a major through line through the exhibition would be this connection between creativity and storytelling in your work. Um, a lot of uh, the, the works in the show, um, they, they highlight your own personal story and a lot of family stories, um, especially with this piece behind us uh, that takes up the entire uh, wall of the museum. <laughs> And uh, it's uh, called Sam and Gaff and features a story about one of your uncles. Can you talk about how storytelling shows up in your work? I think there's, um, 
I think there's a lot of stories, and I think someone can only be expressed in song or in dance. Um, some, you know, I think they work better in text, and then some are, you know, better as paintings or, or sculptures. So I think we're all sort of engaged in storytelling. Um, in terms of Indigenous art, sometimes people just tell the, the barest hint of a story, you know, when, they, when they're selling things in galleries, because they're not trying to sell off their culture or, um, you know, the, the deep teachings of their culture. They're just sharing a little bit, but even that little bit is profoundly beautiful when you go into a gallery or a museum and see see the amazing work that people are doing on the coast here. Um, I I have my own stories, and you know, some of them uh, weren't really being told in our community. We were um, keep, we we're, were being pretty private because we'd had a lot of uh, you know things copyright out of our control, or people would record us without permission, and it was frustrating. But um, you know, there, there, I think we still have this idea that there are important stories to tell and, uh, you know, to find the, the courage to step forward and, and uh, to maybe to share a little bit more so people realize what they're looking at. So a lot of my stories are using uh, classic Coast Salish uh, iconography or approaches, you know, the compositions, the elements, uh, the colors, all of those things are historically accurate. Uh, and also the the desire to tell some personal stories uh, is also an ancient tradition. So it kind of comes across like we're using an ancient language to express, you know, our contemporary lives and our contemporary stories. But a lot of them harken back to, uh, I think other people can read them differently than I intended. I know what I'm thinking when I when I make a design, but I hear other people interpret them in their own way, and it's, it's just as interesting because uh, so many people here have stories about eagles and salmon and, and bear and wolf and and all the rest of it. So yeah, it's 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 meant to be a little bit open for interpretation, which uh, I think invites a lot of people in. Excellent. And um, can you? And also, <laughs> this idea of community was was a great, a large kind of theme um, in the exhibition. Um, so much so that uh, we featured a couple of your collaborators, um, Athena Pika and Angela George, a very accomplished weaver, mm -hmm. um, who goes by Angela Paul now, and. Um, there's just so many le um, levels of community within the exhibition, um, either physically interacting with uh, with another person or kind of having community in mind when you create a piece. So can you speak a little bit to how community kind of shows up in your work? Yeah, well, the, the art form itself I'm borrowing from my community. Um, and, you know, things I'm doing with my artwork will affect the next generation. Um, you know, I'm setting a precedent that's either good or bad with what I'm doing. Um, and we won't really know that for a while, but uh, I have to be mindful that I'm using our art form and I'm, um, you know, in a way representing my community. So I try to be mindful of that and um, ethical about that. And uh, we never do anything in isolation. Uh, we're always working, you know, either someone's helping us lug the big rock around or someone's helping us, you know, giving us feedback on our designs. but. We're always sort of interacting with community, and I'm often talking to people about a specific story or uh, how to pronounce a specific word or uh, getting them to tell me a story again. So it, you know, what you see is just sort of the tip of the iceberg, if you will, uh, when you look at the art. It, it's always, it, it, always, it should always represent community, and it should always represent all the people in our lives. Um, so you know, when my family sees the the salmon gaff piece, they'll they'll smile because they know they'll know the story as well. And they might know different versions of the story. Uh, they might have more details than I know of. So maybe they'll start telling their versions as well. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's, it's always a community endeavor. And when I ask that question, I'm, I'm bringing to mind the uh, sound wall piece that you worked with Angela George, uh, or Angela Paul. And um, in the beginning, it wasn't meant to be kind of a two-person endeavor. Um, mm. But uh, you felt it was important to bring her in and can you talk a bit about that experience? Like, there's a bunch that I can't take credit for. Uh, Corey Douglas um, worked really, really hard to, um, you know, create a, a, a place for Squamish people to, you know, to put our, our artwork up. And he worked very hard for balance because uh, historically they would ask for men's art. Um, and he, you know, he said, we've got a bunch of really strong, you know, women in our community who haven't been given the, the venue they deserve. So he pushed really, really hard for that. And then, um, you know, in the moment, because uh, they were saying, well, maybe one of you'd have the front, one of you'd have the back. And, you know, Corey just piped in and said, well, what if they collaborated? You know, just um, 
just hoping that we could sort of pull it off. But I never really worked so closely with a, a weaver and their designs because it's a, it's a very different art form in some ways. Um, women would carry the deep teachings of weaving and um, you know I, I was told that men keep carry the deep teachings of carving and design. So lots of male weavers, lots of women carvers, but um, that's kind of how it was explained to me. So I never really dug into the weaving um, compositions or formats or just, I, you know, I don't know what all the words mean when Angela was talking about the weaving, but um, we just kept, kept, uh, kept talking and she would scribble something on a napkin and I would just translate it into a vector design and we would use the color scheme from her, her weavings and it was so collaborative, like everything we did was, um, yeah, I can't remember what I did and what she did, um, but, but we, we did, you know, the whole sound wall together. Uh, and, I, you know, it just pushed me as an artist, um, and I, I feel like it pushed us in a good direction because we made all these interesting decisions to uh, not just tell Squamish stories, but tell the Squamish stories that other people could relate to, you know, having lived here for, for even a moment. Um, you know, people become familiar with ravens and, and seals and, you know, all the rest of the things we depicted on that. And uh, the entire sound wall, the entire length of it, uh, is uh, sort of bookended, if you will, um, by the fringe of the blanket. So it's like all of, all of our territory sort of wrapped in this beautiful Salish blanket, um, which was Anna's idea. Um, so yeah, it was, it was nice to show a little bit of her work in this venue, because um, I've always relied on um, people like her uh, in, in community and ceremony. Like she's She conducts so much work in our, our community. So yeah, I was really happy to just to have her in the room and uh, and inspire me some more. And I noticed also um, in the Witness Project community was a huge um, underlying theme of that of that project. Um, so there's an, a photograph uh, in the exhibition and it was taken by Nancy Bleck. Um, it's one of my favorite pieces mm -hmm. in the show, I think because it's just so powerful. Um, so it shows you standing in front of this uh, big slash pile in the middle of a clear cut uh, way up in Squamish territory, um, and you're leading a ceremony um, for the Witness Arts and Environment project uh, that you worked with for about a decade. Um, can you speak a little bit to that project? And since it happened kind of early on in your career, did that really kind of influence how you approached art going forward? It did. It, uh, the Witness Project, you know, we interacted with the general public uh, every week. Um, you know, for me, it was 11 years of volunteering with the project. And it was a chance for us, it, you know, honestly, it was one of the first uh, opportunities for us to bring our culture into the general public um, and to bring some of our, our, our protocols into the general public. So uh, Nancy and the late John Clark and Talazim Kane, uh, our hereditary chief, you know, they, they developed this beautiful program and then our chief was having a bit of a hard time finding people who felt comfortable enough sharing our culture in public? Because um, you know there was, you know there was racism, there was blowback, there was just a million questions. It was it was kind of uncomfortable. Um, but I'd done some work in schools with Halactin, and uh, he, you know he was sort of training me in the, the work I did in the Seagoing Society. So it was you know a good time for the project to happen because uh, Chief Bill was able to, to draw on some of that experience, and uh, we were able to help in his work. Um, and Nancy. She sort of, she sort of like, uh, she's on this line between this sort of art photography and and sort of the reportage of a uh, a war correspondent. So she was able to capture these uh, intense moments in such a, a subtle and beautiful way. Because uh, we're not really trying to convince anyone of anything in that project. We were just trying to show them things. And usually, when people saw what was going on, they 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 would make a decision that maybe would impact the environment a little less or they would, you know, reduce something so they weren't taking so much from the world. Or, you know, maybe they were more active and actually started to do something, um, you know, to to preserve the nature of this beautiful place. Yeah, so anyways, I, was, I got to be a part of that project. Uh, I was just a small part of it. Uh, there was thousands of people who took part, and uh, sometimes I was asked to speak, but, um, you know, for our chief. But, uh, it, you know, the real work was sort of behind the scenes. There was a lot of people doing work in our, uh, our territory to preserve the place, to, to look after it, uh, you know, including my uncle, who was one of our, our fishery guardians, and they helped restore habitat and, 
you know, they kept track of what was going on and you know uh, in that photo I'm the sort of the focal point but um, there's thousands of people standing behind me uh, that, that aren't that aren't seen in that photo and just to explain a little bit more about um, about the witness um, ceremonies and what that entailed um, can you speak to how uh, a witness ceremony would go and how impactful it kind of was for the community yeah, well, it's it's interesting because uh, uh, Nancy Black comes out of um, you know the photography world, and uh, a lot of correspondents, a lot of photojournalists would talk about being witness to world events, but apart from them. So they they saw their role as just you know standing behind a camera, recording things and trying not to let it get to them, um, because sometimes correspondents see you know tragedies and you know horrible events uh, in the world, um, but that sort of emotional distance, uh, that sort of intellectual distance, uh, wasn't, in, in some ways, it's not really the indigenous way. So when Chief Bill heard her talking about witnessing world events, he said, oh, it's funny, we have a, a word, otsam, where we, we talk about being a witness, but being a witness in our community is a very active role. You represent your family, you represent your culture and your community, and you're supposed to do something with the knowledge you acquire. So if you're at a ceremony and you're called as a witness, you're, you're required to do something about what you learn in that event. So anyways, it was an interesting <clears throat> sort of setup. And um, the, um, the project itself, you know, we took people from uh, pretty much the heart of Vancouver in uh, Yale Town. And for 15 bucks, you could drive from the Roundhouse Community Center up into Upper Squamish. <coughs> Excuse me. And there was a little bit of ceremony where we would call witnesses and in the, in the mechanics of it are we would just shake your hand with a token and um, just ask you to to be a part of the, the work so they would explain you know what was going on in the area explain uh, developments you know legal developments or ecological developments and then uh, ask these witnesses to speak and we, we normally ask people uh, a couple people from our community and a couple people from the outside world and people had profound things to say about what they saw uh, going on. And sometimes they were confused and sometimes they were inspiring and sometimes they were angry. And sometimes they were feeling hurt and sometimes they were just grateful to finally see an old growth forest after having lived here for a number of years. So over the course of the spring and the summer for 11 or 12 years, I'm not sure how long it exactly ran, um, thousands of people from the general public got to see what the logging industry looked like, what the old growth forest looked like, what the traditional territory looks like, and got to meet Squamish Nation for the first time. Uh, many people, even within the town of Squamish, had never actually met us, had no idea that we were still around. And we had a chance to showcase, uh, I think it was uh, I think it was genius of Chief Bill to, um, to use our potlatch culture in a modern context, um, because I believe it's respectful, and I believe it's profoundly intercultural and I think it creates change uh, well it change, creates change slowly it creates a kind of change that sticks in a community mm. you spoke a lot about the, the power of kind of just listening to each other um, and hearing each other speak rather than trying to um, kind of force agendas or, or that sort of thing yeah I mean one of one of our elders um, she's passed away now but um, you know, she'd be talking to a group of youth, and uh, you know, sometimes kids weren't didn't seem to be paying attention, and she never really got that upset about it. And she said, "I'm not just speaking to these kids today. I'm speaking to these kids 10 years from now, 20 years from now, because they'll have they'll, they'll remember this knowledge somehow, and they'll come sort of unbidden to mind when they have a problem. And um, you know, just as as children, they don't you know realize the significance of some of the teachings she had, but she said one day they would." So, you know, she felt it was very important to share them with them and so that they had it sort of in their toolkit, like if you will, when, when they needed it. Mm. And you did some live carving uh, during that project and uh, you told me about, you know, interactions that you'd had with people <laughs> that were, had little to no information um, or kind of knowledge about indigenous culture. Um, and some of those sculptures are still in the forest uh, today. Mm -hmm. um, can you speak a little bit about uh, that? Yeah, well, um, we we, had, we kind of have to prove occupation of our territory sometimes legally. Um, we we use all of our territory all the time, but 
if we do it correctly, there's no sign of it. But then legally, people say we're not even using that land. Uh, our chief wanted to leave some markers behind, and he asked me to make some carvings. So uh, we did three carvings, and they're different locations in, in Upper Squamish, kind of in the middle of nowhere um, in terms of modern society. But for us, it's in the middle of the heart of our territory. Um, so there's, yeah, there's three what would have been nicknamed the Cedar Women, and they just represent the society of women who um, were the caretakers, were the knowledge keepers of the, the long history of our traditional territory. And it seemed like an appropriate marker for um, something that, that fell completely in line with what the Witness Project was about. Mm. And then did that project influence uh, your subsequent approach to creativity and carving? Because I know the Heart Story Project um, also involved you doing live carving, um, these uh, women figures with the holes in their chest. Um, I'm wondering if there was any kind of resonance there. I know that one has its own story that goes along with it. Uh, in, in a weird way, I mean, I got to practice on my own. The, the, the carvings I did during the Witness Project, it was sort of when I was, um, I, you know, I'd learned enough from Hall Acton to kind of start doing my own projects, and they were nowhere near as organized as what he's able to pull off. But um, when I when I worked with Halakton, he he would work in the public, which is really uncomfortable. Like it's like taking your entire desk and all of its contents and your computer and going somewhere and setting it up with a few hundred people around you asking questions while you're working. So he he's he's been doing that for 40 years or more, and um, it's inspiring to watch him work with community, and he he handles it with such ease and grace and uh, and joy. And uh, it's been a wonderful ambassador for our people and a wonderful inspiration for people like me who were uh, too scared to talk about being indigenous in the, in the outside world, you know, because it always led to this kind of conflict or a painful interaction. And he was just sort of bold enough and cheerful enough to pull it off. Uh, and anyway, so learning from him, um, I was able to bring that to the Witness Project. Um, so, you know, Chief Bill was looking for people to bring our culture and demonstrate it. And uh, Halakin was actually one of the first speakers for the project. And then, uh, you know, I was able to keep going back up and, uh, you know, do do like drum making or regalia paddle necklaces or whatever it I was doing with the group. Um, but yeah, a lot of that I learned from him. And uh, I think he had to, I think he had to figure out a lot of it on his own. And I, I can remember a time when he picked up his ancestral name and he started using it publicly and I can remember this sort of blowback from our community, like, don't, don't, don't use your name out there. It's a sacred name. It's only for us. And, you know, don't, don't use your Indian name in public because, you know, it'll get people riled up. Like, we were scared of being hurt, um, scared of putting our heads up. Uh, so we kind of kept our head down. We kept quiet. And for him to start using his ancestral name, you know, we were, you know, a lot of people were quite scared. I was curious about it, but... Um, it seemed to be absolutely fine. And I, I did see him weather a lot of racism when he did it. And I saw, I saw him weather a lot of uh, fear, I think, from our community, using his ancestral name publicly. But he said, no, this is, this is you know, my ancestor's name. You know, my father gave this to me in ceremony, and I'm proud to carry it. So he was just bold enough to do it and uh, inspired a bunch of other people to, to start using their real names in public. Mm. And we used your ancestral name uh, in the title of this exhibition which I think adds a lot to just who you are um, yeah. as a person and as an artist. Yeah, yeah. I've got a, what's called a new name. Um, uh, there are ancestral names in my family, and um, the, the, the sort of the links in the chain have been broken by residential school. So my family hasn't done many ancestral names. We haven't, we haven't done the work to, to bring them out in public. And I'm not sure if we will in my generation, but we're, we're trying to create the kind of pride and awareness and um, uh, enough knowledge, to, uh, maybe for the next generation, to pick up our ancestral names. So in the meantime, uh, Halakton's father actually gave me this new name, Tox and uh, So it's a different sort of category of name, um, but because it means the root of it is splashing, uh, there's a lot of people vying for my name in the canoes right now. There's a lot of people out there splashing, so they're all bucking to get my name next. So maybe it'll get passed on. <laughs> Amazing. Um, and I wanted to ask you a bit about um, the fact that you're an educator and you have been for many years and um, you teach at Langara and Emily Carr. And um, I just wanted to ask you a bit about 
Does being an educator inform the work that you do, or how do, how do you feel it shows up in your work? Uh, well, I think, you know, I've always had these elders say we're, we're all teachers. So the way any, any one of us carries herself when, when we're at a restaurant, when we're at work, there's other people watching, you know, there's a, we're, we're informing the next generation of how to behave in the workplace, in general public, how we treat people, how we treat family members. We're always sort of informing each other and the formality of doing it in a, in a school was another level of that. So sitting with elders in Squamish Valley, uh, they were very strict with me about how I should be behaving if I'm working with children. You know, they're very, 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 very um, um, ethical. They're very, very disciplined when it comes to, you know, working with kids. So they had really high standards for me and they, you know, they're always shaking their finger at me, telling me to up my game, to, you know, to be better, to be the best version of myself and to, to be mindful that everything I do, um, you know, children will be watching and learning from. So yeah, I think um, I, I think it, I think informs everything I do, and I, you know, I'm also mindful that I'm I'm setting precedents with my art, um, you know, because the art was almost extinct around here when I started. There was very few people who knew how to do it, and very few people um, could do it and get paid for it. So we were inspired by people like, you know, like Susan Point um, to, to pick up this old form and start using it again. But being, you know, one of the um, early people here to pick it up again, myself, Raina Troro, um, we, we realized that we were sort of informing how it's done. Uh, so the, everything about the color use or working on computers or, you know, putting public art up, all of that has to be uh, sort of relearned, I guess you could say and retaught to the next generation. Mm. And I was really happy to hear that your Heart Story project um, was going to kind of take on this new life or a new iteration. Um, can you tell me a bit more about what that will look like and where it sort of came from? Uh, well, the, the origins of that, um, that piece were uh, an elder telling me a story uh, just about being wounded and about our, um, our efforts to heal ourselves. And it's, it's kind of a long story, but, um, you know, when I, when I did this little carving to try to express that idea, um, the way, the way this way I understood the story when it was told to me, um, you know, became this sort of object and Susie Webster, a colleague of mine, a, a dear friend of mine, um, saw the piece and thought it should not just be in my backyard, but she, you know, she thought that we could have a larger conversation around it. And she'd seen how Holacken works in the public. You know, when we carve something, when we make something together, we have these, you know, wonderful conversations. So, um, you know, she actually asked Halakton what we should do with this project. And he said, carve seven of them and put them all over the world. And then we can't just ignore them, you know, because we asked for his advice and he told us. So we kind of have to do that now. But what we're hoping to do is to in, involve other people who might do it in their own way. So in my way, I'm used to wood carving, but maybe someone will make it in stone or maybe someone will, um, you know, bend willow trees into a human form and, you know, plant flowers around it. I'm not sure how they'll do it in another place. It doesn't have to be permanent. It can be um, really sort of ethereal and temporary because um, the, 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 the gist of it is just talking about um, as human beings, just sharing uh, sometimes how we've been wounded and how we can help each other heal. and. Um, in healing, I think we'll stop trying to consume so much. We'll stop trying to, you know, you know, find addictions or find material possessions. We won't just keep taking from the world. We'll feel more content in ourselves and maybe uh, walk more gently on the world. Mm. And do you imagine that in collaboration with Indigenous peoples around the world kind of thing? Or uh, I think there's a lot of Indigenous people all over the world talking about things this way. Mm -hmm. And there's also a lot of people, uh, I know people in the men's healing movement talk about things this way. And Susie's been uh, sitting with a group, uh, she's involved in a women's group, and they were all talking about this as well. So I'm not sure who will, will want to do this next, but um, it doesn't, it's not, it's not an indigenous story in some ways. The, uh, the idea of, um, you know, taking from the world and trying to stuff it into that that hole, you know, that sometimes where our heart should be, 
uh, you know, leads to this overconsumption, whether it's food or material possessions or, I mean, how much, how much does one person really need? I, I see people like the super rich that are in the world now. And I, I can imagine, I, I imagine it, if we were sitting at a big feast table and one person took 99% you know, percent of the food for themselves and the rest of us were just you know, eating scraps. And I, I think that's uh, also wrapped up in that story. You know, if we were more content. Um, but I, and I think there's a lot of people talking that way now. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm, I'm curious to see who will, who will tackle it next. I know I speak for a lot of people, but I'm really, really looking forward to seeing more from you. Mm-hmm. And uh, I know that you're working on a um, residency with yes. Angela Paul yep. up at SFU. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that project and um, kind of have you, how you both are working together on that? Yeah, it's, uh, it's an educational residency. I'm based out of the museum at uh, SFU campus in Burnaby. And uh, Angela will be kind of overlapping a little bit, but uh, she'll be doing a weaving um, and she, she had this idea of doing this gigantic weaving. So a blanket 10 feet wide. I'm not sure how tall it is, but an enormous blanket. Um, and she needed a big loom. So I'm working on this loom for her. And uh, it's, it's hard to translate some of our traditional activities into the modern world uh, because the, the loom would historically be buried in the floor of our longhouse. But we can't do that in the buildings today. So uh, I'm setting the uprights into large stones, carved stones, and uh, making a whole toolkit um, to, you know, you need a, like a fairly involved toolkit to make bulrush mats. You need a fairly large toolkit to do all the wool processing and weaving. And uh, a lot of people in our community have a hard time uh, getting hold of those tools. I've never actually seen a full kit in our community. So I'm going to try to make one and then leave it behind you know, for Ange and, and leave another set behind for the people at SFU so that other people can pick up those tools and start working with them. And I mentioned that, I mentioned weaving tools are fairly similar from different parts of the world. So um, there's other people very curious about the looms as well, because they come from different parts of the world with, you know, beautiful weaving traditions also. Mm. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. It's been an absolute pleasure being able mm. to work with you on this project. And uh, Stepping Into the Circle is on until October 5th. Uh, We uh, invite you to join us. Thank you.